Good evening, and thank you for joining us. This is the fifth of a seven-part series titled Wasted, Small Efforts for Big Change. The program is planned around a series of conversations about waste, environmental justice, and the role we play in the future of sustainability. I'm Tony Marino, Executive Director of the Rockwell Foundation. Founded in 1935, our mission is to promote and support environmental education and conservation in the lower Connecticut River Valley. Please go to rockwallfoundation.org to find out more. Uh, Rockwall has been pleased to collaborate with the following co-sponsors, City of Middletown, Lower Connecticut River Valley Council of Governments, better known as RiverCal, and Wesleyan University Sustainability Office. This program could not have happened without the assistance of many individuals, in particular, Cheryl Baldwin, Janice Edenmeyer, Jen Kleindienst, Kim O'Rook, and members of the Rockwall Program Committee. A special shout out to Liz Brittany, the Communications and Grants Coordinator at Rockwell, as she will be managing, managing the mechanics of each of our programs. And to Michelle Eckman, Program Consultant to Rockwell, whose efforts have made this series possible. Thank you to all of them. We acknowledge the heritage of the indigenous people of the state of Connecticut. We acknowledge the responsibility we hold for the social and environmental justice and the protection of the natural resources on their land on which we live, work, and play. Just a reminder that our next program in the series is on April 29th for a repair workshop with Janice Edenmeyer, Community Resource Planner at Rivercott, and Virginia Walton, Recycling Coordinator in the town of Mansfield. Join us and learn about repairing items found in and around your house and fix them instead of throwing them away. Please sign up for that event or the composting workshop on May 8th by using the link that Liz will put in the chat or by visiting our website at rockwallfoundation.org. The, the theme of tonight's discussion is the conversation on environmental efficacy. I'd like to welcome Michelle Eckman who will lead tonight's program. Michelle, take it away. Hello everybody um, and thank you. I'm gonna actually be moderating an incredible round table here. Um, and I'm really excited about tonight's program. So as you know, our state is in a waste crisis. A lot of you have been coming to these sessions for the past several weeks, probably already knew it before. Um, and to solve this crisis, it literally is going to require all residents in the state to take part of the solution, to be part of the solution. Well, we can't necessarily expect that you all just know what to do and how to advocate for solutions. So this is what this workshop is all about. We have three incredible people who work in waste reduction solutions in one way, shape or form, and who are here to share their expertise, their perspectives from their little corners of the world. So I welcome Marilyn, Lou and Kevin, who will go ahead and introduce themselves. Marilyn, go ahead and start. Oh, I think you're gonna unmute yourself. Oh. Um, hi, I'm Marilyn Cruzaponte. I'm sorry about the picture here. I'm not sure what's going on. Um, what I'm seeing is fuzzy, but um, I have been in public works in Connecticut for 30 years. And I've either served as an assistant director or a director of public works, New Britain, Hartford, and now East Hartford. Um, a significant part of the of uh, my career has been dedicated to solid waste management planning. And um, I really find that the municipal role has been um, exciting in that I am right down with grassroots dealing with day-to-day -day issues of solid waste uh, management, how it impacts people's lives, the quality of neighborhoods. Um, and so, my experience in speaking today comes from that mu uh, municipal perspective where I think um, there's a significant role to be played in developing public policy um, and environmental policy. And uh, my background, as some of you know, uh, in public works included writing the um, mattress recycling bill, which was passed in 2014. That bill is an example of something that came up from a grassroots concern in Hartford about the mattresses that were strewn all over the city. 
and um, a product that ended up costing a very poor city hundreds of thousands of dollars that then became a subject of discussion about extended producer responsibility and what place producers have in managing a product at it, the end of its life. So, you know, that took a lot of effort uh, across the board, many municipalities, many folks, urban, rural. And so I just uh, come to this meeting with that focus. Um, I hope that I can provide some uh, examples of how local initiatives really can shape public policy on a state level. And in the case of mattresses, on a national level, because that bill became a model legislation for Rhode Island and California and in the United States. So I'll leave it at that. And we'll talk more about local solid waste planning from the perspective of public works in uh, the next hour and a half. Marilyn, thank you so much. We are so lucky to have you here. So very lucky. We have a celebrity in our midst, people. Okay. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Lou. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, good evening. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you to the folks at Rockfall Foundation and to all the viewers today. just want to say happy Earth Day to everyone. Uh, my name is Lou Rosado Birch. I'm the Connecticut Program Director at Citizens Campaign for the Environment. Um, we are a uh, bi-state grassroots organization uh, in Connecticut and New York uh, with uh, over 100, uh, I'm sorry, over 100,000 members, contributing members in Connecticut and New York State. Uh, we do public education, grassroots community organizing, and um, advocacy on a range of environmental issues, mainly focused on three kind of priority areas being public health, toxics, and energy policy, clean energy, and anywhere where those kind of three priorities overlap. Um, I, we, we've been involved for a number of years um, doing legislative um, advocacy at the Capitol. Um, CCE was one of the groups that was instrumental in um, establishing the 10 cent fee and the two year phase out on single use plastic checkout bags. Um, and we are um, a member of the Connecticut Recyclers Coalition, which is a diverse group of um, municipalities, there's government agencies, recycling industry professionals, and uh, NGOs dedicated to um, doing continuing education and, and, and providing services for uh, the state's recycling community. Um, we also worked for a number of years and, and, and were instrumental in getting toxic fracking waste banned in the state of Connecticut. Um, and uh, currently we are working with, with Kevin's group and a number of others um, that have been represented throughout the, the series uh, working to modernize Connecticut's bottle bill. And so that's one of the things that I'll be touching on this evening. Um, I'm a community organizer. Um, I, I, I got started doing this work, canvassing, knocking on doors, getting people to sign petitions and write letters to their elected officials. Um, and uh, been doing the work since about 2009. So um, very happy to be here. It's an honor, honor uh, getting to work on these issues and getting to represent Connecticut folks on these important uh, public health and environmental policy issues. And I'm just pleased to be here with you all on, uh, on Earth Day. So thank you again. Thank you so much, Lou. I remember meeting you a number of years ago when we were working on getting the plastic bag and uh, passed and, and it was town to town and you were really like my first glimpse of what mobilizing and campaigning was all about and you're everywhere you work really hard and we're happy that you so I'm going to pass it over to Kevin Boudreaux. Thanks thank you so much Michelle uh, my name is Kevin Boudreaux. I'm a staff attorney at Conservation Law Foundation or CLF. Uh, CLF is a member-supported nonprofit organization uh, that works to protect New England's environment for all people. Uh, my work at CLF is focused exclusively on our zero waste project, which is laser focused on the current waste crisis that uh, you all have been talking about with Rockfall Foundation throughout this series. Uh, we as a state, as a region, 
are still reliant on antiquated uh, end of the pipe supposed solutions to our waste, like landfilling and incineration, uh, where we need to be refocusing uh, to emphasize reuse, redesign, refillables, uh, and, and things like composting and better recycling systems like the bottle bill uh, that help move us up the zero waste hierarchy and get us away from having to deal with all of this waste on the back end. Uh, just a little bit about me and where I come from in all of this work. I've been at CLF for about two years. Before I joined CLF, I worked at a different nonprofit organization where I brought citizen enforcement lawsuits against companies that were violating federal, federal environmental laws like the Clean Water Act. And a lot of the cases I brought were against leaking landfills and incinerators across the country that were poisoning communities. So I really saw firsthand the way that these uh, poor waste practices impact our communities throughout the country on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, our work at CLF uh, is really focused a lot on law and policy. We try to work with uh, the grassroots organizations like Citizens Campaign for the Environment and the folks working on a municipal level and a state level like Maryland uh, to try to implement the best laws and the best policies to, again, move us forward to a zero waste future where we're not relying on landfilling, where we're not relying on incinerators. Um, and you know, one of the things that we see again and again is that waste impacts our lives in so many ways, and most of them go unnoticed in the day to day. And so it's really important to come together in these types of settings to talk about how we individually and we collectively can help push for the right changes that move us towards a, a cleaner, healthier future, especially when it comes to our waste. And so I'm, I'm really grateful to the Rockville Foundation for putting on the series and for, uh, uh, for inviting me to join you all uh, here on Earth Day. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Kevin. I apologize because my connection is super unstable. Um, so I apologize in advance if I freeze up. Um, I can't really see anybody right now. I have faith that you all can hear me. Um, and, and somebody can let me know otherwise. We can all hear right. you. If, you. if you turn your camera off, it might help. Okay. Off and on. It's also a lower carbon way to go. So um, <clears throat> the way that I should have said this up front, the way that this is going to work is I have um, a, a bunch of questions that I want to ask this amazing roundtable. And they're going to respond to the questions. They're going to riff off of each other. Um, but we also want to hear from you. And we have some questions of, of our audience that we would love to hear your feedback on. But I'm going to start with Marilyn. So on a municipal level, how does a waste crisis how does a, the waste crisis impact the municipal public works operations, their budgets, and the residents? So, um, again, my perspective is a municipal perspective, and I'll tell you, you can't get away from people. Um, you, this is really where you have to be committed to community service, where you have to be committed to listening to folks who um, individually, household to household, are viewing their interaction with waste as something, you know, individually an experience. Some people will want everything cleaned up in a moment and they don't care where it goes. Others will be, you know, hovering around their neighbors and wondering why they're not doing things the right way, not sorting things out, not putting out and presenting items on the curbside properly. Um, you know, we get a lot of that type of interaction in public works. If you take a look at public works in every community, we have responsibility under the law, um, the town does through public works for managing waste within our borders. We have 169 towns in the state and that's one of the things that really has always concerned me about waste management. It can't be just on and based on those very small borders we have. But in Connecticut, that's a reality. And that really does create some problems for us in terms of waste management um, and managing um, 
waste as a town in an affordable fashion. Uh, I also would say that the waste crisis in Connecticut, the principal impact on a municipality is on the taxpayer. You know, we are looking at taxpayer rates and tax rates that go up. The significant cost of managing waste in public works, whether we're doing it with public employees or we're hiring uh, haulers to collect, um, is really not, uh, although, you know, it's not the issue. The issue is the overall cost, whoever is collecting. Um, the other impact of this waste crisis on municipalities is the disposal cost. You know, we have uh, tip fees that are rising because capacity is not being properly addressed. And so the end disposal seems to be the focus, just like Kevin was talking about. We get all caught up on disposal. Nobody thinks about the origination, the generation of waste. And really that's where we need to turn the corner on discussing this locally. We could have all the policies in the world but until we have residents understand that we are the generators and the decisions that we make on a daily basis in terms of what we buy, how we buy it, what we consume, you know, how we dispose of it, all of that is really where we need to center our, our attention. Municipalities tend to spend our time on the collection end. Public Works is good about big trucks, and equip, you know, equipment and rolling, the, you know, the equipment down the road and getting things just cleaned up. Um, we haven't had as much a role to play at the front end discussing who really should be responsible for how waste is dealt with. And at the front end, how do we minimize waste? How do we talk to and change behavior in residents? That can't really be done on a municipal by municipal basis. We have to have a statewide conversation that sets some priorities and decides to design a system that looks at waste from the front end at the beginning. So the waste crisis impacts municipalities, partially taxpayers, operations, the cost of operating the trucks and public works are obscene. You know, we, we, we end up paying just for MSW collection on the curbside, you know, almost 1.5 million a year. You know, that could be a mill in, in many communities. Uh, we, we have expenses that are related to that, that, that are associated with workers comp, with exposure, the cost of replacement of equipment. All of that does not go away. Um, and it's interesting during COVID when people shifted from their workplace to home, municipalities reported significant increases of collection of MSW, while in the workplace, it just went down. So who bore the cost of that? It was taxpayers. And, you know, it was interesting because on the recycling side, many of us saw an increase in cardboard. Well, everybody was shopping. Uh, you know, they had nothing else to do. Um, I asked myself, what is the, why is this behavior so ingrained in us, this consumerism? So on a municipal level, I would end that to summarize, it's, it's the budget and the cost of disposal fees, operations fees, and ultimately for residents, there has been no change. You know, the cost to residents is the no change. We need to pivot in a different direction. And the leadership has not been there. We have been practicing repeatedly the same thing. So there's a cost to that ultimately when you don't change. Um, and that's why we're here, because we need to decide whether we're taking a left-hand turn or a right-hand turn on the front end of this waste crisis, not at the back end. Yeah, I mean, I wish you could see my face because I'm nodding my head and I'm nodding my head. And and everything that you say is for weeks just within the series, but certainly 
so much within the environmental justice community as well, um, and so forth. And I want to throw this, to, you know, your comments out to Lou and Kevin. Um, feel free, you know, to jump in if you want to. You know, what do you? There's a lot to comment on from the individual level as well as the state level too. I mean, I, I, I would love to just agree with and echo what, what Marilyn so insightfully walked us through, which is that, you know, municipalities, towns and cities and residents and taxpayers bear the cost of the waste crisis, and yet they do not have any control over the front end. You know, especially when it comes to all of this packaging and the like the cardboard waste and the cardboard recycling that Marilyn was was mentioning and all of the plastic that our food comes wrapped in these days and all of the unrecyclable plastic film that's wrapped around all of the products that we buy. Uh, residents and towns and cities aren't the ones that's designing that junk and deciding to inject that junk into our lives. It's, you know, it's the big corporations, it's the producers who are making those decisions. And that is, the, it's, it's one of the, it's one of the biggest fundamental problems with our waste system, that there's that disconnect between who gets to make the decision and who has to bear the brunt of the impact when it comes to the cost and when it comes to the negative environmental impact of landfills and incinerators. Uh, and so, you know, the awareness that we're all trying to build about this through these conversations, like the one we're having tonight, helps us move towards policies, uh, you know, things like extended producer responsibility for packaging, which seeks to uh, change that balance so that the producer, so that the corporations have to bear some of the cost here is really key to shifting it from the back end management that gets stuck with the towns and cities up to the front end, to the people that actually have the power to make more of the decisions to lead us down a healthier path. Absolutely, 100%. Um, Lou. Uh, I don't know that I have a lot to add to that because uh, Marilyn and Kevin really uh, hit it on the head. I think I would just add what probably most of the folks on this call know is that ultimately the um, costs and the impacts of all of these types of issues, whether it be solid waste, toxic pollution, what have you, um, obviously the, the impacts are disproportionately borne by low and, and moderate income communities um, and urban environments, communities of color. And so um, there is a, you know, there is a clear uh, environmental and economic justice component to a lot of what we're talking about right now. Um, and it's one of the reasons why it's so important that we have these type of conversations, because in order to really move forward, not just with how we manage our waste, but also how we treat our low income communities um, and what type of seat at the table we give them, what type of voice we give them throughout these process needs to be done in a holistic way. Um, so that's just kind of my way of agreeing with everything that Marilyn and Kevin have already said. Mm -hmm. But you bring up a really important point. You know, a lot of us are not bearing the direct impacts of this excess waste um, and this waste crisis. So when I think about, you know, the, the waste to energy facilities that, you know, in name sound really nice. Oh, we can burn our waste and create mm -hmm. all this, oh, you know, energy that we can use to power our homes. Well, the truth is only 20% of that gets converted into energy. The rest of it comes out of the pipes and into these low-income communities, particularly Hartford and Bridgeport, that are bearing the brunt of that. And that all directly comes from what we produce at home. And so, Lou, I'm gonna, you know, toss this to you because you, you work so hard in advocating for statewide policy. And, you know, what are some of the actions that the legislature could take in 2021, hopefully, and you know, if it has to get kicked further down the road, but what can the legislature do to improve the solid waste recycling stream? So there's a there's actually a few bills that are being considered by the legislature currently that we think are really important um, and that have, have become priority for us. Um, as many of the folks on this call probably at least have heard of, there's been a whole process called the 
uh, Connecticut Coalition for Sustainable Materials Management, which Kim and Marilyn and some others that are on this call today have been involved in. Um, and what that is, is it's the state essentially took, put together this big undertaking to, to round up all of the different uh, municipal solid waste professionals um, and to identify some priorities. Well, they made a list of recommendations to the state legislature about actions that they could take both at the state and the local level to start to address this crisis. Um, that bore some fruit in the sense that a number of bills were introduced. Um, three bills that I wanna highlight for you all would be Senate Bill 1037, which is, which is probably my top priority this year. It's a, an act concerning solid waste management. It does a number of things, but one of the most critical pieces is that this would update Connecticut's bottle bill, um, which is uh, long overdue for an update, um, which will uh, expand the number of containers that are included under that refundable container deposit. It would raise the deposit from five to 10 cents on every container that's covered by the bottle bill. And it, would, and it also has a convenience component, um, which is intended to put more convenient options for container recycling um, in every community. So we will see more redemption centers. We'll see bottle machines and all of the large chain retailers. Once again, part of the goal here is to make sure that um, those underserved communities have increased access, right? Increasing the equity and the accessibility of this program is a critically important part. Senate Bill 1037 also has a section that authorizes the commissioner of DEEP to establish an incentive program for municipalities that are looking to transit, transition to unit-based pricing approaches to solid waste management, formerly known as pay as you throw, which essentially is designed to help save the municipality money on its solid waste budget by putting the cost of managing your household trash right up front. So in other words, by asking consumers to pay directly for the trash services that they are using, as opposed to charging you every year through your taxes, you actually create an incentive for folks to reduce waste, recycle more, and that in, in turn helps uh, save the municipality money. Another bill is uh, Senate Bill 6502, which would phase out uh, polystyrene, styrofoam, uh, food service packaging and lunch trays, school lunch trays at schools and institutions of higher learning here in Connecticut. Um, polystyrene is toxic. It's, an, it's a known carcinogen. Once it gets into the environment, uh, it does not break down and it is not being recycled. The recycling of uh, polystyrene is extremely uh, cost and energy intensive and there are no municipalities to my knowledge uh, in Connecticut that are doing, that are offering uh, polystyrene recycling. And then the last bill that I would highlight is Senate Bill 930, which re relates to uh, food waste recycling. So in Connecticut, in 2013, there was a law passed that prohibited uh, large uh, food producers, distributors, and wholesalers, catering uh, halls, that generate more than a ton of, tra of food waste per week and are, are within 20 miles of an approved composting facility to either send their food waste to be composted or to recycle that food waste. And the idea here is, is you know, food waste uh, organics account for something like 25 to 30% of our solid waste stream on an annual basis. And so once again, by diverting some of that organic material out of the waste stream, um, you're able to lighten the load a little bit for municipalities, but at the same time, you're also able to produce compost, which can support sustainable agriculture, um, as well as um, increase um, food waste recycling, um, donations and things like that, which can help feed the hungry. And so this bill, Senate Bill 930, would actually expand that radius to require any large generator of food within 40 miles of an, of an authorized uh, composting facility to, um, to donate or to compost that food waste. 
So there are some changes that we're asking for. We think that that law should apply to anyone in the state, any, any food generator that generates more than a ton per week and is within that range, as opposed to, you know, specifically singling out the distributors and the catering halls. You know, we think this should apply to schools, uh, to hospitals, food courts, cafeterias, these types of things, any large food generators, you know, should be involved in this program. So those are a few concrete measures that legislators in, in Hartford can take, take this year, can take in the short term to help uh, make the waste seem better. I mean, that's, those bills are super important. Um, and, and certainly we encourage the passage of those bills we all don't work up in Hartford, but are there things that people like all the folks on this call, the people who might be listening to the recording later, what do we, so these bills are up for, you know, a vote, hopefully. Um, is there anything that we can do? Uh, yes. What I'm going to do is I'm, uh, I started to post the bill pages in the chat so that folks can actually see the name and, and some of the details exactly what those bills do. Um, but all three of these happen to be Senate bills. And so um, probably the most important immediate action that folks can take would be to contact their state senator and say, I support Senate Bill 1037, uh, Senate Bill 930, and Senate Bill 6502. Um, and, uh, and let them know that, you know, once again, what you've learned today, Connecticut's in an urgent waste crisis. And, uh, and urgently need to reduce waste uh, in the state. These are three common sense uh, ways to do that. Excellent, excellent. Um, you know, and if, if possible, if there's a link that you could also share um, where if your organization has a way to sign up for action alerts so that people, um, you know, can just, easily click those links and get those letters sent off to their their legislators that would be amazing if that resource is available you know, sure. what we want to do is one of the things you know as a result of this this particular session and all these sessions is we want to enable our audience to take action right we want to not only give you the knowledge but we want to be able to provide you the skills and the opportunities to take action right you all are here for a reason because you care our job is to help make it easier for you so thank you so much for that um so you know, kevin we've heard a lot about the scope of the waste problem in connecticut um the bills that are up you know um for votes in the legislature and you know, as Marilyn pointed out, you know, so much of this lays in the hands of us as the consumers, um, but the problem can seem really big, right? So how can individual advocacy efforts help make a difference with such a large problem? Um, yeah, th thanks, Michelle. You know, individual advocacy efforts are key here in a lot of ways. And, and you can look at individual actions through several different lenses. And if you look at individual action only on the basis of, okay, what are we gonna do to reduce the own, our own individual waste in our household? Well, that can only go so far. And it is exceedingly important for us to do as much of that as possible. But we need the big systemic changes to really tackle the problem. And starting first and foremost with the with the bills that Lou just mentioned, you know, supporting those bills, and as Lou said, reaching out to your senator and telling them that you need to count on their support for these bills is huge because we need to pass in Connecticut. We need to pass these bills this year to make a dent. And kind of looking on a more granular, granular level at the individual bills, you know, when it comes to the bottle bill, uh, you know, modernizing the bottle bill is essential. And I'm not going to repeat all the excellent information that, that Lou went through when it comes to modernizing the bottle bill. But I just want to note that we're sending tens of thousands of tons of containers, of beverage containers, to the incinerators every single year because our bottle bill has not been modernized in a way that will effectively capture those beverage containers and get them out of the waste stream. And so our individual understanding of what's happening to these materials 
and our individual outreach to the decision makers at a municipal level, and especially when it comes to these bills at a state level, can have a really big impact. Um, and, and when it comes to the, uh, to the polystyrene bill, to Bill uh, 6502, I just want to mention quickly that, you know, tackling the single-use plastics problem uh, is hugely important, and it is a prime example of where individual action on a collective level has had such a big impact over the last few years. As people work in their own towns and cities to implement bag bans and polystyrene container bans, that helps build the momentum at, this, at the state level to get these types of things passed and to, and to get these things out of the waste stream to begin with. And, and polystyrene and single use plastic bags are a prime example of where we need to look at the front end. Because single-use plastics, they are they, they cause a huge problem for our waste system, but they're not a waste problem. They're a production problem. The only answer to these unrecyclable single-use plastics is to stop making them in the first place. We can't solve it at the back end once they end up in the waste stream. And polystyrene is a particular, particularly pernicious example of this, especially when it comes to environmental justice. Most of the polystyrene foam that ends up in these lunch trays and ends up in these food and beverage containers is manufactured in a few select places in this country. One in particular is an area of Louisiana that's known as Cancer Alley because the petrochemical facilities that are making this product are so poisonous to the people that live nearby. They have cancer rates that vastly outstrip the rest of the country. And so as we do more to understand impacts that these single use plastics have on our lives and especially on the lives of other people throughout the country, we can do more to force the action at the local level, at the state level to really make an impact on this problem. Kevin, I learned so much from you. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, Marilyn or Lou, do you wanna to add to anything that, that Kevin's oh. talked about? I, I would like to add um, a little bit about the bottle bill and modernizing the bill. Um, I think we have to recognize on a local level, that is the type of bill that when enacted becomes a vehicle for behavior change. It is a tool of education. In public works, we could do all the education and I know we have other folks in, uh, you know, in this meeting who understand the challenges of public education, behavior modification, um, information sharing to enlighten folks about um, practices and behaviors that are, um, you know, produce a positive impact on the environment. I look at this situation as an opportunity for a municipality to just rev up action in its town without cost to me and to my budget. The bottle bill, if modernized, has a number of impacts. The behavior impact is that litter becomes eliminated that was already proven with the original bottle bill. That was the intent of the original bottle bill. And then it just became something that people did. We got cavalier, we did not do any sort of evaluation of its effectiveness. And now we're here modernizing it. It should pass. It would have an incredible impact on behavior, literal elimination, but more. It rises to a level of allowing us to jump off, launch off of a bill like that to talk about other ways to minimize waste. Something like that is, um, you know, again, it's um, something that people can relate to, they can touch. And, it re and it's something that folks can relate to at every economic level. Many times what happens with these policy initiatives that are being discussed right now is that folks who can intellectually manage that or have an environmental philosophy, understand the significance of it, can participate in that process. But folks who are just trying to make bread and butter happen at the end of the day, and they're dealing with the kinds of basic life issues are not thinking about that. However, a bottle bill gets modernized and all of a sudden, you know, this becomes something that 
can become a topic of conversation for some of the other environmental and blight issues that people uh, actually Im are impacted by. So I support this bottle bill on that level. The other thing that it does is that it actually offers an opportunity for economic development. Let us not forget there can be a connection between what we do in terms of addressing waste management and re-focusing uh, our attention on developing economic opportunities that actually help with minimizing waste. So here we have a bottle bill that may actually compensate those who are involved in the business of you know, collecting this material properly so that they can run a business and have it be something uh, multiplied throughout many communities. We only have about 11 redemption centers in the state of Connecticut. You know, uh, it's very difficult for those with the kind of money they're getting from the current bottle bill to expand or to even be attractive to people who are coming in and using it. So I think that economic development that can be spurred on by a bill like this is worthy of promoting because it then refocuses people's attention to this can be economic development building. So again, public works has resources that are limited. If we can use policy and legislation to wake people up who normally can't be awakened because they're busy with other real stuff in their lives, mm -hmm. if we can eliminate litter and not have to have my public works employees who should be building roads, collecting trash, mm -hmm. and if we can spur on economic development, well, I'm going to sign up for that. And so should everybody at the state legislature, because it's not something that will hurt any municipality or any resident. Amazing. Thank you so much. Trust is such a tremendous um, insight and perspective there um, that I hadn't had before. So thank you for that. Lou, did you want to add anything before we kind of open this up to growing our round table a little bit? You're muted, Lou. Kevin and Marilyn did such a great job. Um, I think you've covered most of the bases. So let's let's move the agenda. All right, awesome. Um, so now we're gonna expand our round table to all of our our audience because you know, we all want to know from you know hear from you. Um, you know you have perspectives, um, and you know we can help carry the message too to a certain degree. Um, but we want to know from you, and don't be shy. Um, you know, you can raise your hand to um, answer the question. Um, you don't have to type it into the chat, but if you don't want to answer out loud, you're welcome to type it into the chat, but we'd love to hear from you. Um, so one of the questions that we have is, um, what is something related to waste that you'd like to see at the state or local government that your state and local government officials take on? What would you want your local or state officials to be doing related to waste that maybe you're not seeing right now? Can I kick this one off? Sure. So um, thanks. One of the threads that runs through many of the different um, efforts that we've been talking about today, Marilyn mentioned it earlier, extended producer responsibility. Once again, it's the idea of making sure that um, that the, the entities that create and that profit from these products pay their fair share of the cost to manage the, the waste. Okay, it's uh, one of the core principles of the bottle bill. Bottle bill is one of the earliest examples of uh, extended producer responsibility, EPR, that we have. Um, the mattress recycling program that Marilyn talked about before is a great example of it. This is a concept that should be extended to you know, any number of different hard to recycle items. Um, and part of the reason for that is once again, when we talk about the cost of waste management and recycling and how those, those costs impact cash strap munici municipalities um, and taxpayers, we are going to continue to advocate increasingly so as we move into the future for polluter pay 
type of strategies to managing this waste. And EPR is a great example of that. So, so if, if you know, if I had a, 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 a genie of the lamp and I could get, you know, three wishes, uh, there would probably be some variation of past, you know, a bigger, better bottle bill, um, an EPR program for, uh, for consumer packaging, for wasteful consumer packaging, like all of the cardboard and, and, and uh, plastic film wrap that our, our municipalities are, are struggling with right now. Um, and probably uh, an EPR type of program for toxic and hard to, hard to recycle materials such as batteries. Um, you know, there, there's a bill right now that would, uh, that would establish an EPR program for, um, for propane canisters right? So the small little canisters that you plug into your portable uh, propane grill, um, those things, you know, folks have been throwing those in the recycling bin and they, they end up getting in with the mixed stream recycling. And there have been a few explosions um, at some of the transfer, transfer stations because once those can't, those are pressurized. And if they're not completely empty, once it gets into, you know, a piece of recycling equipment, um, you know, that's heavy machinery. And, and if those things are punctured or damaged, uh, they can, they can, cost lives. Um, you know, same type of thing with batteries, um, smoke detectors. There's lots of different products out there um, that have significant impacts on the environment, can have significant impacts on our health, and that are expensive to recycle. So if I got to, to, to wave a ma magic wand, it would be EPR uh, mm -hmm. almost across the board. I'm, I'm in the same boat with you completely. Um, so I'm just going to, you know, bounce this back to you real quick. And I really love to hear from some of our audience members too, but, um, so can any of that, I know some of this work is being done at the state level, but with so much of, uh, of manufacturing happening outside of our state, is this something that can be addressed at the state level or are we, should we really be pushing for legislation at the national level as well? Is that for me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say all of the above. Um, we yes, uh, you know, regional and 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 national approaches um, would be ideal and make a lot of sense on a lot of different levels. Unfortunately, progress at the national and regional level uh, tends to move at glacial speed, and so we continue to advocate at a state and local level to try to drive. Um, some of the regional efforts around these type of waste management issues. Okay, great, thank you. All right, folks, what would you like to see your legislators, your elected officials do in your communities about waste? You can go ahead and unmute yourself and jump on in. Hi everybody, this is Krishna Winston from Middletown. Uh, there is a piece of legislation pending um, in the Congress, which is called the Break Free from Plastic Pollution uh, Act. And it was sponsored originally by Tom Udall and Alan Lowenthal. Tom Udall has now retired from the Senate, but Jeff Merkley has picked up the legislation. And uh, a number of towns, including Middletown uh, in Connecticut, have passed resolutions supporting that legislation. And we're asking our public officials to uh, make that known to the sponsors of the bill and to, to our legislators at the national level. So that's something that we can, we can all get behind. Uh, they're mainly, the bill is mainly focused on single use plastics. And then something that, that I think we would welcome uh, would be some financial support from the state for starting a unit-based pricing system, uh, mm -hmm. doing the technical work that it takes and also getting together uh, information that we can use to sell it to our residents. Great idea, awesome. great, great info. And Krishna, if you have access, to that um, bill that you mentioned um, and you can put that in the chat, that would be fantastic. I can't do it right now because I have to go to another meeting in three minutes, but <laughs> I will, I, I will uh, feed, I can, feed that I can information. Post something. 
Yeah, I can okay. share some. If you, if you okay. have it, that would be great. Well, thanks for joining us, Krishna. Thank you for that. Thank um, so you. So know, we're also interested in you know, what kind of waste problems do you encounter in, in the neighborhoods where you live? Things that like really drive you crazy that you wish were addressed. You go ahead and unmute yourself. I won't even make you turn your camera on because mine isn't on. Well, I'd like to respond just from um, a public works perspective and as someone who's lived in, in urban communities, uh, I think that the um, issues of blight oftentimes are a response to poverty, to transiency uh, associated with uh, poverty and economic challenges. Um, the impact to communities is really devastating in terms of quality of life. And um, you know, I think that having a way of creating equity for uh, those who can't afford you know, proper disposal, um, education and training um, of landlords who oftentimes uh, add to the problem uh, of blighted areas. Uh, there's really a need for uh, looking at uh, generators where they live, as well as, you know, in terms of the practices of disposal and economic issues of poverty. I worked as a consultant with a Latino landlord, a Colombian fellow who owned and owns many, many properties in Hartford, who called me because I speak the language and was able to meet with him as a landlord to put together strategies for waste minimization in large apartment complexes. As you may all know, uh, most municipalities uh, define service through public works on the basis of units. So um, a one through six family or one through four family are the housing stocks that are serviced by the municipality where all other residential complexes, six units and above or five units and above are designated even though they're residential, are designated as commercial. And these are really falling out of the waste collection system and contribute to the um, really outrageous volumes of municipal solid waste, the lack of recycling, um, bulky waste, um, you know, all kinds of hazardous waste that's deposited into containers with municipal solid waste and recyclables. So anyway, I worked with this um, uh, owner of 880 units of residential housing. We actually put together a program that at the front end, when he met and his staff met with uh, future tenants, um, provided a video and provided an outline of all the waste streams that they were to manage and how to work with the, their office in addressing those waste streams. Uh, that's a, a, a seriously responsible way for a landlord to do it. We have so many people with various cultures and languages. You know, if, if I could wave a magic wand, I would really create the kinds of training um, for property owners and also for, you know, members of the community to become better prepared in their knowledge of solid waste and recycling and waste minimization. If I could do a, you know, a school for waste management, I would start with landlords and property management firms and have them realize that taking care of the waste stream at the front end of it is going to save them money and is going to maintain the kind of conditions that are you know, healthy for their tenants. So that's really an area of interest of mine because I've lived in urban areas and lived in apartment complexes. They're neglected and they're very hard to deal with. Um, I speak from a municipal perspective because I know 
people do not spend a lot of time thinking about waste issues day to day. It's those of us who have either an interest or a sense of environmental responsibility who get involved in these efforts. We've got to do much more work to expand education, not only in one language, but in multiple languages, and to address cultural um, issues and how trash is viewed in other cultures. It's, it's right. not maybe as important to some folks that is, as it is to others. Behaviors are different in other countries than they are here. So I raise that because we can't forget that we have a growing diversity of people in our state and that can't be ignored. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Zach, love to hear from you. Hi, I have a twofold question. One is, I mean, it's directed at everybody, but I, I feel like it's more, one's more towards Lou, which would be, how do I encourage, how do you recommend encouraging my neighborhood on recycling more? As in, I notice, you know, you have the blue bin, the green bin, and in my direct neighborhood, it's really just me putting out the blue bin. Mm. So is there a way, as opposed to shaming my neighbors? <laughs> <laughs> and then secondly, it would be directed towards Maryland. My municipality doesn't offer, uh, the town doesn't offer waste removal. So companies come in. Is there a recommendation for evaluating a waste provider, a waste removal provider or anything like that? Like, can you explain, I guess, a little bit more about the that practice? Sure. I don't know, do you wanna go first, Lou? No, no, you go ahead. So let me just respond actually to the first question because I'm in the process right now of launching a program. I'm in the test process. It's called Recycling Star. And what I've done is I have about 30 people who received this um, self-education tool. And the self-education tool takes them to five or six links. They read about the resources available by the municipality, educational materials that teach you how to properly recycle and not contaminate your blue bin. What happens at the end of that process is that someone, that someone who was reading all of that material, and it's an electronic, um, you know, uh, checklist, um, sends a note directly, submits a note to Public Works that says, well, you know what, I've read all of the links, I am a recycling star because I've learned so much, I have improved the ability I have to properly recycle. Um, and we then go out and deliver a reflective star that somebody can put on their recycling bin that shines at night. They also get a free bulky collection at their curbside. And finally, they, are, they commit to serving as ambassadors to their neighbors by going out with um, a little card saying, you know what? I did this and I got a star, but more importantly, I got a free collection of bulky waste. And we're getting feedback from the test group of um, 30 people. Um, the feedback is great and we're gonna be expanding that program. We feel that you know grassroots education efforts have to happen like you're saying, neighbor to neighbor, but we live in New England. So let's not forget that that works against us in terms of some of the interactions that people want to have or refuse to have. Um, and so I, I just point that out because that was one of the comments one of my testers gave me. She also added that there are a lot of people around her neighborhood who are poor and they can't be bothered with recycling because they're feeding their kids. So we need to be sensitive to who your neighbors are and what their life issues are. On the question of uh, subscriber programming, um, even though a municipality is not engaged in the delivery of the service to residents, it still legally has a responsibility to ensure that waste is being managed in accordance with Connecticut state's, state law. So if you have a question about a private hauler who provides subscription service to residents, that can be raised with the municipality. That's a very um, important advocacy role 
that you can play is to ask a municipality, is this hauler who offers service and charges people to collect their trash held to a standard around uh, what trash is collected, what recycling is collected and what services are provided. So I would urge you to call the municipality and you know, ask that hauler to be accountable for the kinds of services being offered and making sure that they're in line with um, state mandated uh, requirements. Yeah, the, the only thing that I would add to that, and um, because I was, that was pretty comprehensive, the only thing that I, I think I would reiterate is, and, I, and I, I think this is relevant because of the fact that part of what we're talking about today is advocacy. And my same answer to you about how to better engage with your, your neighbors um, on recycling is the same answer that I would give you if you came to me and said, well, we have a problem in town. How can I get something done at the state level? And that is um, get up, show up, speak up, right? Go out and have conversations with your neighbors. Um, it's not an easy answer because it requires a little bit of work and investment from you. But the truth is, is that if, you know, if, if you care about these type of issues and want to see something change, this is the only way to do it. Um, and so one of the things that really stood out to me about why the program that Marilyn mentioned is, is sounds like such a great program is because of the whole idea of an ambassador, regardless of whether or not you choose to participate in that program, and I encourage you to do so if you, if you can, um, is you got to get out and have that conversation with people. Um, I'm going to drop something in the chat here, which is, um, which is a, red, a resource that the state of Connecticut um, through the Recycle CT program has put together. Um, Recycle CT is an educational portal uh, dealing with recycling. And if you click on that, it's in the chat right now, you can scroll down. And in addition to signing up for, you know, different types of program updates, you can access a video about what's in and what's out of the blue bin. You can also download a helpful flyer that shows what's in, what you can put in your blue bin and what you cannot, right? So one of the big problems that municipalities are dealing with right now is something called wish cycling. People wish it was recyclable, so they just throw it in the blue bin. Please don't do that because <laughs> um, that actually creates not just headaches for the people that are dealing with this stuff, but it also leads to costly delays and that type of thing um, and contamination because once something, once, you know, you contaminate, um, once you contaminate a load, uh, you know, if, it's, if you have grease or some other type of um, contaminant, caustic material that gets in there, they have to actually dispose of the whole load. So that creates tons and tons of waste. So it's really important to educate yourself as to what you can and cannot put in your blue bin. And then if you have the time and maybe you have a couple of bucks to run to Staples and run off some color copies of this flyer, the state won't send them to you, I know, because I've asked. I don't, I don't believe they have the resources to provide everyone with a hard copy of this. But if you have the resources to provide at least the folks in your building with one, you can print one of these up and pass them out or just, you know, put it uh, near the front door, near the recycling bin so that it's staring people in the face when they take their trash out. What's in and what's out? What you can and cannot put in the blue bin. It's such a helpful resource. Um, and can I just add something else, uh, okay. Michelle, sure. um, for Zach? Um, one of the things that I, I would encourage you to do is that you begin with something that is not directly dealing with the recycling piece, but something that everybody can relate to. So, you know, a cleanup cam ca campaign in your building that, you know, goes to the issue of quality of life can be a way of getting people um, invested. Uh, and then it opens the conversation, you know, people will help other people. If you're cleaning up, somebody will come and join you. So find a way that is kind of an indirect way. And uh, I think that you'll likely get surprised by the support. It's a great answer. Uh -huh. if, if, if I could just tack one thing on to all the great information that Marilyn and Lou just provided, and I agree with all of that. Another thing that you can do is encourage your community to adopt unit-based pricing, which we've uh, we've talked a little bit about tonight. But 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 unit-based pricing, attaching a financial incentive for people to reduce 
their waste is one of the best ways to drive education on what can be recycled and to actually encourage them through a financial incentive to you know use their blue bin and actually do the work of recycling. Um, it's a, it can be a great component as a part of all of this. Let's just talk a little bit more about unit-based pricing because I think that it sounds like something that's from another world or something that's really difficult. Um, it is a challenge politically for municipalities to explain this to uh, a resident without them seeing it as a tax. Oh my goodness, I have to buy a bag and, and I already pay enough taxes and I don't wanna do that. However, the conversation, and it's a difficult one, which I think the state does have to help municipalities engage in, as was mentioned by someone, the uh, person who just spoke from Middletown. Um, we really, it, it's, it's complicated for people to understand, but if you look at it as a utility, you pay for as much heat as you use. You pay for as much electricity as you use. And those people who use more and like to stay warm like I do, pay through the nose. And those who wear their sweaters and are conservationists will pay a lot less. And so I just, again, Educating about a concept like unit-based pricing, smart, pay as you throw, is really a challenge. Um, so I just throw it out there because while the concept has been shown to work, um, trying to get it understood politically and, and not as a tax is a whole different issue. So true. So true. And that, that, you know, especially on helping get it understood is another great reason to support Senate Bill 1037, which not only modernizes the bottle bill, but charges deep with coming up for uh, a, a program for towns to help implement it, which would be enormously helpful in that education campaign and helping develop the understanding statewide of what unit-based pricing does, why it isn't a tax, and how it is, on the whole, a great move in the right direction. If I had a magic wand, I would clone the three of you. I would bring you to be with me wherever I go, because the way that you all speak about this is just, I mean, it, it motivates me. Um, I know it would motivate everybody um and i could never speak to it as well as you you all do so um but i'll do my best um are there any other um questions out there um we've got a, a small but mighty group so i want to make sure if you all have a question or something that you want to say about waste in your community i want to give you that opportunity All right, so um, with that, I'm going to see um, you know, Lou, Kevin, and Marilyn, do you want to say anything as closing comments? I, I would like to um, say a word or two since we've been talking about advocacy. Just want to give folks a few tips. Um, I am an in-house communicator for CCE, what that is, I am a registered lobbyist. In-house communicator is a term for someone, for example, for, from an NGO like Citizens Campaign for the Environment, rather than going out and purchasing a contract lobbyist that may have any number of different clients. Um, I work for CCE, uh, I wear a number of different hats. One of them is government relations. And so um, I'm a registered lobbyist in the state. I wanted to talk a little bit about some things that I think are important for folks to know and to think about when we talk about advocacy. Um, and so the first thing I wanna make sure everybody knows is the most important thing when you're reaching out to your legislators is to know and understand the process. Okay, it might seem obvious that, you know, when there's something going on in your community and you wanna see a change that you contact your rep and your senator Sometimes people get very frustrated and they, you know, 
they call their senator or their representative over and over and they say, you know, this isn't getting addressed or this isn't, you know, the bill might not do what we need it to do or whatever it might be. It's important both for the, the, the sake of being productive, but as well as for their sanity, that you understand the process and you put your energy in the most uh, effective and productive places, right? You also need to know who your legislators are. They also need to know who you are, right? So develop a personal relationship with these folks. Um, I can, I'm going to share my screen real quickly because I want uh, folks to see uh, what a few things. This is the Connecticut General Assembly website. This is a portal for everything that happens um, at the at the state at the state level, at least from the General Assembly, the House and the Senate. Okay, and you can see here a few things that are important. Is they have oh, that was not supposed to do that at all. Um, they have the schedule. The Senate and House schedule, you can see right up on top, so you know when they're going to be in session. Okay, uh, a more detailed scheduled events, schedule of events as you scroll down, so you can see everything that's happening today. You can click on these links and it'll show you not only the agenda for that particular meeting, but it'll show you the YouTube live link where you can observe. And I encourage people to do this because this is your right as a citizen, as a taxpayer to participate and observe these types of proceedings. Okay, you scroll down a little bit farther and you have a number of legislative resources here, including the session days, the rules, uh, a find your legislator app where you can type in your address. Okay, um, show you what it looks like. I'm gonna punch in the, um, the address for our Hamden office. And you hit find and it'll tell you exactly who your state rep, your state senator and your US Congress people are. It'll also let you know any bills that, that those, at least the state legislators are working on or that they've co-sponsored. Um, and if you click on their names, it'll give you their web page and their contact information. So this is a really, really important utility for folks to have to once again, know who their legislators are and be in their ears. Just be consistent about these type of things is really important. When you're advocating, when you're in the process of talking to your legislator, I think that it's important. We talked about the personal relationship thing. That thing is also really, really important when it, the legislator may not agree with you or want to do what you're asking them to do. That mm -hmm. personal relationship makes it a lot harder for them to ignore you or to just write you off, right? And so it's nice to sometimes start out with just a personal story about where you live, um, what you are interested in, what you do in the community and try to find some common ground with those folks before you just start asking them to do things. Um, when I talk about issues, I also always explain the problem first. Then I say a word or two about the solution, right? And so if we're talking about the fact that the bottle bill hasn't been updated in, in many years and we have waste problems and litter problems in Connecticut. Towns are getting killed by the cost of recycling this material. Um, and, uh, and all these containers are not even covered. The solution is we're going to pass Senate Bill one, you know, 1037. It's going to increase the deposit, put a bottle room and all these retailers. Um, and then to get an agreement from them. So problem, solution, agreement. Senator, representative, can I count on you to support this? Or can I count on your vote? They like to sometimes say, well, I'll look into it, which is why the last thing on my list is to follow up and to make sure you stay in their ear, you stay in their inboxes. And if they do tell you, well, I have to look into it, make sure to follow back up in a week and make sure that they know you're paying attention to everything that they're doing. So that's just kind of a few tips that I have when it comes to talking to your legislators. Um, keep in mind they're Taxpayers, they're normal folks like you and I, and technically they represent you and I. And so it is your right and your responsibility to, to talk to them about these kinds of issues that concern you and ask them to work in your interest uh, in Hartford. Thank you for that, Lou. And it's so true. And you know they don't hear from enough of us, to be honest with you. So, right. um, and they do appreciate it. Um, you know, they are there to represent us. They need to know what we're thinking about. Um, 
I'd like to add something about advocacy. Um, and I think it's important, uh, again, on a local level. Um, let me give you a quick example of something that just happened in the last few months. Uh, a number of folks in town have been concerned about um, bulky waste collection um, from people who don't have vehicles. So people cannot use the transfer station. That's an equity issue. Um, they began to talk on Facebook and Twitter and our mayor's office is tuned in to these conversations. Um, they got to a council person and had a conversation with that council person who then turned around, talked to the mayor and then asked them, asked to speak with the director of public works and myself, I'm the assistant director of public works. And a lot of people do know I spend a lot of time on social, on um, uh, waste issues and have that expertise. So what happened was that what, what bubbled up from a group discussion became a topic of conversation that my director and I listened to, and we're gonna look at modifying, you know, the bulky waste program in, in before the next budget cycle. So that that is a case of people talking to one another. And as I mentioned to you before, Zach, it can your your volunteerism could be starting a cleanup and that becomes an easy opportunity to connect with people in a positive way that's not too demanding. Two, identifying a legislator in your town who happens to have a real interest in environmental um, issues and conservation and uh, with your own expertise in waste management, developing a relationship with that person as an expert in waste and saying, is there any way I can be helpful to you in expanding your knowledge, in doing the lifting that needs to be done to be an elected official who's effective in bringing about change? Is there homework I can do for you? So you can really become a volunteer expert to a, an elected official locally who is interested in this topic. And you can then help that person be successful and you can push an agenda that is of interest to you and probably of interest to other people using your expertise. So it, it does certainly, Lou mentioned something that's important. You can operate at that level or on a local level, you can have a massive impact by just connecting to one or two officials or to your neighbors in the ways that, that I've described. So local, local, local is important um, and relationship building is key to advocacy. You cannot do advocacy without relationship building. Absolutely. Agreed. Absolutely. Kevin? I, yeah, I, I agree with all of that. And I would just like to add, especially to what Marilyn, Marilyn was saying that you can be, there are so many different levels in so many different arenas in which you can be an advocate. You can have those conversations with your state representatives. You can have those conversations with your federal representatives as well. The, the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act was mentioned earlier tonight and Lou dropped information into the chat about it. Reach out to, um, to Connecticut's senators. Reach out to your representative in, in the U.S. Congress uh, and tell them to support or co-sponsor the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. You can be an advocate at a local level and you can be an advocate in those conversations with uh, community members, with your family, with people in your, in your own household. Uh, you know, I, I know that uh, in the last entry in this series, uh, Michelle walked people through waste audits. And uh, some of you may have attended that. If you haven't, watch the recording. You know, understanding what's in your waste on a day-to-day -day level is, is really key to taking uh, some of those first steps as an advocate. Like, we can all be advocates just by beginning to understand the scope of the waste issues, what's impacting us and talk about it with your friends, with, uh, with members of government, with your family, with anyone who is willing or somewhat willing to listen. Uh, we, we drive change through uh, the day-to-day -day conversations 
and through the day-to-day -day opportunities to educate ourselves, however small they may seem. Oh, I mean, it's so inspirational, all of you. Um, you know, it, it's one conversation at a time. It's one little influence at a time um, that becomes what you know, was known as collective action. And it works. And for anybody to say this problem is too big, it, it isn't. Um, and I'm grateful to all of you who have joined this call live. Um, and for all of you who will be listening to the recording later, um, you know, share it. Um, share it. Share this message as far and wide as you possibly can. Um, we, I'm going to try to see if, um, if I'm turning my camera back on. See if that works um, before I may end up back out in some never never land. Um, this has been amazing. Um, I, I I couldn't be more grateful to you, Kevin, Marilyn, and Lou for this. Um, I really feel that this. I'm so glad we recorded this. There is so much here, um, and and it gives me hope. And a few other people have made comments in the chat that everything that you've shared and the energy and the enthusiasm that you bring to this conversation gives me hope. The kinds of questions that Zach has asked is, gives me hope. So thank you for that. Catherine, you want to chime in something? Yeah, I, I, didn't, I wasn't going to say anything today. I'm uh, West Hartford's recycling coordinator. But tonight's uh, really resonated with me as I um, went out in the community and had my first uh, non-COVID event where I interacted with a uh, zero waste swap sort of um, uh, uh, display and then also what's in, what's out. And I thought, oh, there are not very many people here. You know, how do I get this message out? But just you three who spoke so eloquently inspiring me, who then will go out and inspire my 20 or 40 people, you know, it sort of gives me hope that this is the way it works. It's not that you're gonna have an audience of 120 or a thousand every time but it's that you share your knowledge with me. I've been making notes on my laptop. You know, it better informs me when I go out in the community. So I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was a reminder to me to keep, you know, going forward uh, with my, you know, swap this for that and thinking, you know, what difference does it make? But nope. it does make a difference. Don't Thanks. be discouraged. I think a lot of this, we can chalk it up to this is just a sign of the times, right? COVID-19 has got a lot of folks focused on their own immediate realm right of things that are affecting them and their families and so i think we're all having the same experience turnout hasn't been as robust as you would like but i am the type of person who likes to look for silver linings and i think that while covid may have created some challenges and and has isolated some of us right quite literally right physically as well as social distance um, it's also given us new electronic and online tools that I feel in many ways have brought a lot of us, at least in the activist realm, much closer together. Um, and so we should continue to use these tools and leverage them moving forward, even when things start to return to normal. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, and I appreciate that message, you know, Catherine, that even though there weren't necessarily a ton of us here, we can still make huge impact. Anybody else want to have anything to say before we bid you all adieu? Happy Earth Day, everybody. Happy Earth Day. This is a great Happy way Earth to, day. to be you. together. Every day is Earth Day. We all know this. So hopefully we will see you all next week for our, our Repair Cafe. And uh, yeah, I can't believe we only have two sessions left. Of May 6th will be our um, community and uh, backyard composting session. Um, but you're going to see a lot more from the Rockfall Foundation going forward. So keep us in your, in your, on your horizons. So again, Kevin, Lou, Marilyn, amazing. Amazing, amazing. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you all. It was a pleasure, Thank Kevin and Lou. Same to you. Thank you all. Let's take care. Everybody stay healthy.